Hello, everyone. This is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I am zooming in live from Suzy headquarters in Midtown Manhattan um, in a beautiful fall day here in New York City. And really happy that so many of you have decided to take the time um, to speak today about AI. And obviously, um, at this point in the year, now nearing uh, November, uh, I would imagine many of us would have AI fatigue. But the reality is that we are really very much early on in the AI journey um, in terms of how it's going to transform business culture and society. And uh, I've been on more than a few stages over the last couple of months talking to major brands, major organizations about how they should look at AI in the context of their business model, um, in the context of their customer, their needs for data security and data privacy. Um, and the legal needs uh, of these companies with the need to move quickly and move, as we like to say, the speed of culture um, so, so so many companies could take advantage of these changes that are happening. So what I'm going to be doing today is walking you through a presentation on what I see as the current state of AI relative um, to going to market and having an impact on your consumers. Uh, it's really so hard to believe that nobody was really using consumer AI tools until about 11 months ago. And the, the change that it's imparted in this world is just fascinating and it's something that I spend a ton of time thinking about. So um, I'm going to dive in. If we have time at the end, we'll have time for questions. And again, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm the CEO of Suzy. Suzy is a market research software platform. We work with many of the leading brands in the world to help them put their finger on the pulse of the consumer uh, so they can truly be consumer centric. And uh, we've been doing these webinars ever since March 2020 uh, when the pandemic hit. And uh, it's great to see that we're still uh, chugging along here in October of 2023. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to dive right in. So many of you probably know about the Gartner hype cycle um, and, and its impact on new consumer technologies that come to bear. For those, for those who don't, I'll give a quick kind of descriptor of it, which is when a technology first comes um, into the consumer zeitgeist, many times it has this peak of inflated expectations where everybody likes to think this is it. And the, the traditional consumer news media obviously is always searching for stories that they can kind of put out there to get people fascinated with the future. Um, once something hits this peak of inflated expectations, you often see a consumer technology on the front page of major newspapers, leading off the evening news, something that that while your son, teenage son, might have first learned about, all of a sudden, you know, your grandmother's talking about, um, and it becomes this sort of um, huge sort of buzzword that occurs. And then what often happens is it hits what's called a trough of disillusionment. The initial optimism and excitement for technology starts to fall short, and what often happens is a lot of people write it off. The media writes it off. Um, a lot of companies write it off. And they kind of just put it in the back burner. And then what starts to happen is the real work begins. Uh, without the glow of, of kind of the mainstream world, the real engineers, the real developers, the real innovators, the real builders start to use this new technology to really put it into practice for society. And then we start to hit what's called the slope of enlightenment, where people start to see, ah, this is why people are excited about it to begin with. And then finally, we end up at this plateau of productivity, often slightly below that peak of inflated expectations, but certainly something that becomes a major driver of society. <clears throat> now, of course, not all technologies follow this path. Um, in fact, few do. Um, there are definitely um, varying degrees of, uh, of adoption of different types of technology, and some never get back to the plateau of productivity. Um, look at 3D printing. 3D printing was something that we all thought was going to be a huge, uh, you know, driver of the way that people print their own toothbrushes in their home, print their own houses even. We thought by this time, um, back in 2014, 10 years ago, that everybody was going to end up having their own 3D printer. And as we've uh, seen through the decline of 3D uh, printing stock prices over the point when it had this peak of inflated expectations, um, it never really came back. Now, some would argue this is in sort of like um, that trough of disillusionment and real work is being done. Maybe the technology is too early, but this is something certainly has never recovered from the peak of inflated expectations. Voice is another great example. Um, when, when Alexa and Siri first came out, we all thought, myself included, that by this time, none of us would be typing anymore, right? We would all be just speaking into 
our phones instead of typing. Um, and we slowly start to get a little bit frustrated with some of these technologies because it didn't always translate what we're talking about. And some of these technologies really never had that mainstream adoption um, in terms of changing the way that people live and work and play that we thought voice would. Now I'd argue voice again is one that really still is early days. And, and arguably series technology has become a lot more reliable over the years, but we certainly don't see people talking into their phones in replace of texting or typing like we thought we would at this stage in the game. And then you have crypto, the most recent sort of um, darling of tech innovation, which had a famous boom and bust cycle. Uh, you know, during the boom, which is really 2020, 2021, many said that crypto was going to be the new world reserve currency by now. And there was a point when everybody was talking about it. And then what started to happen was you started to get the swindlers and the people that were getting involved in, in crypto for nefarious purposes. And you had huge scandals like what happened with FTX. And a lot of people have written off crypto and the price followed along. But I don't know if you've been following the crypto market recently, but the price of Bitcoin, for example, is starting to creep up. But more importantly, a lot more substantive work during 2023 has happened with crypto than many people actually realize. And crypto now has become sort of like a laughing stock for part of the business world. But for the people who are really doing the work on the blockchain, which is the real technology behind crypto, they're as optimist, optimistic as ever that this is going to be sort of a productive plateau as a new technology in society. Um, so is this time different with AI? Is AI just going to be another one of those trends which, which plays into the hype cycle and gets everybody to love it, but often falls off, never returning to its original promise? Or is this time different? Does AI as a technology look a lot more like the internet itself or the iPhone, which certainly really never even let up from when it had inflated expectations and kept getting higher and higher expectations in terms of its impact on society? Well, I would argue AI actually does fall into that category. Um, I actually believe that AI is going to have a transformational um, impact on society and on the business world in the form of a major innovation cycle like we've seen um, throughout the past several hundred years. And if you look at these major waves of innovation cycles that we've seen um, from the first wave of water power and textiles and iron, where we're able to actually have machinery do things beyond the work of humans and their hands to um, getting involved in steam and power and rail and entering the industrial revolution um, as we hit the 1900s to getting, um, you know, electricity for society, which um, shockingly is something that um, is barely um, 150 uh, years old in terms of its impact on um, on our culture, probably even less than that. My math isn't great this morning, um, but electricity and, and that impact to gain new electronics and and the impact of electronics on on the consumer zeitgeist and the aviation, and everything that unlocked to the fifth wave, which is something that I live through, which is the advent of the internet. I talk to uh, my kids when I tell them I was in college, we didn't have the internet. We didn't really have phones that access the internet. I had to go into a computer lab to email. The internet was basically invented when I was in college. Um, I'm a Gen Xer. That's fascinating to think about, but the internet's advent and the software and new media revolution that came along with it has been driving innovation in business um, for the last 30 plus years. And now I believe with AI, with the intelligence behind the technology of digital media, we are gonna be entering a completely new wave of innovation. It is a, in my opinion, a seismic shift that actually has far more, far greater implications than some of the earlier trends that we talked about earlier, which is why I think it warrants such um, critical um, you know, in, uh, attention in this day and age heading here into 2024. So why, why is AI have such promise? And I would actually put it into a couple buckets on why I think AI is different. And I think the first thing you have to look at is the unprecedented rate in which the power of AI is growing. If you look at previous innovation cycles, like say with the iPhone, the iPhone one and the iPhone two were about 18 months apart. And with every new launch of the iPhone, it was at least 12 months before a new hardware came out with new features, a better battery, a better camera, a bigger screen, et cetera. AI, however, is improving at an unprecedented rate. I talked at the onset today about how consumer AI tools were really just being adopted about 11 months ago. But within that 11 months, there's actually been platforms like ChatGPT, which we'll get into, 
um, a second version that came out, which was far more powerful than the first version. So the unprecedented rate of improvement really gives a promise for continually increased expectations on its impact. Um, it's very easy to use and there's minimal coding required, meaning many new technologies in the past, like the blockchain, for example, required consumers to do something different. It required consumers to adopt new habits and understand new technologies, where AI does not do that. AI largely just asks consumers to type in to a device what they're looking for in whatever language they speak. And just doing that gets you 80 to 90% of the way there from getting to realize its potential. Now, obviously, there's prompt engineering and the ability to get much more sophisticated with the inputs of AI. But a huge, you can get a very far along of the way there in terms of unlocking AI's potential just by understanding how to speak whatever languages you speak. And that is definitely different than 3D printing or the blockchain or some of these technologies in the past. Even the iPhone itself required people to type on a device where in the past they had a BlackBerry and they were actually typing into a keyboard. That was a different change consumer habit. AI really doesn't have that. And because of that, it truly has unlimited potential. For those who aren't really familiar with how generative AI works, and just to oversimplify it, there's really three main uh, components of AI. There is the database or the neural network where all the information lived. In the case of ChatGPT, it's the internet itself, but billions and trillions of data points essentially feed the brain of any AI model, um, which you can tap into to extract information. Some databases are just limited to the information that your company has created where others actually is all the information on a particular topic ever created in history. Uh, the second part of it is the prompt. Um, a prompt is the language that I just spoke of that allows you to input information to get information that you're looking for out of it. And then the information you're getting out of it is the content that spits out. And the content isn't just text, as many of you know, it's also videos, um, it's also imagery. Um, the beauty of generative AI is um, it's multimodal and it can push out content in a variety of different ways. But to oversimplify it, there are three main components. You have your database, you have your prompt, you have the content that's spit out. And when you think about the use of AI in any enterprise application, to me, this is the easiest way to kind of frame how you're thinking about what you're gonna build or what, you're gonna, um, what application you're gonna develop. So we mentioned prompts are the core AI programming language. Many companies, Susie included, are investing in training and prompt engineering because all prompts are not created equal. And the more specific that you can get um, in framing and ask from the AI models, the better it can be. It truly is a garbage in, garbage out scenario in terms of how these things work. Uh, the early winners so far in AI have been some of the biggest tech players uh, in the space. Um, Bing, as we all know, made a landmark uh, investment deal with OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, to power its Bing search engine. Um, you know, with ChatGPT, which definitely gave it um, a nice jump uh, in this space. And Google is a company that um, has long been developing um, in the AI space and is really stepping on the gas with its Google Bard um, search engine, essentially slowly integrating some of this AI functionality into its core search engine. So again, when you talk about not needing to change consumer habit, when you think about Google integrating AI into Google, Google is the most commonplace sort of low involvement task that people do every day. And people are gonna start being using AI without even knowing they're using AI because it's gonna be integrated into nearly every tool that they're using on an everyday basis. Um, companies like C um, Siri and Alexa, which is uh, of course Apple and Amazon, while at first might be behind, I wouldn't count either of those companies out um, either. Uh, Tim Cook announced just this week that Apple is going to be investing $100 billion in AI. Um, Amazon has so many applications for AI, a little bit of a different business model, but I would expect both of those companies to step on the gas moving forward as well. So the reason that so many of us are on this webinar today and so many of us know AI is because of the chat GPT platform, uh, which really has been a fascinating case study in consumer adoption of a new tool in a new category at an unprecedented rate. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ChatGPT was not made available to the public until the end of November of 2022. So here we are barely at the beginning of November of 2023. So again, 11 months ago. And before that, no one really had access to it. And I can't remember another time where a platform that was introduced to society in such a short period of time 
is now impacting nearly all of us. And it's something that we're all mentioning on an everyday basis. To contextualize that, um, it took ChatGPT five days <clears throat> to, excuse me, to get to 1 million users. And you know, compare that with Facebook, who, which we all thought was a viral phenomenon back in 2004. It took them 10 months uh, to do the same. So you know, you're looking at a 40 uh, time uh, multiple on that speed um, with ChatGPT. And then zooming ahead to 100 million users, it took ChatGPT two months to get to 100 million users, um, where, you know, you look at platforms like TikTok, which were also kind of viral phenomenon in society, it took them nine months, over four times as long. So this is a, a technology that, <clears throat> based on its ease of use, based on its limitless applications, has gotten a meteoric adoption amongst consumers, and that number obviously only continues to grow. We mentioned earlier about the rate of change of ChatGPT, and I always thought this was fascinating in terms of just how much more powerful ChatGPT4, which came out about six months after ChatGPT3.5, which is the initial debut product in November of 2022, what the leap in output was there, where you look at uh, the verbal GREs, for example, and ChatGPT3.5 scored in a 63rd percent, uh, percentile, ChatGPT4, 99th percentile. And you can see the same with the LSATs, um, same with biology, same with the, the uniform bar exam. It went from the 10th percentile to the 90th percentile. We're talking about this type of leap in performance in a six month period. So when you zoom out and think of where this technology is going to be three years from now, it's almost too hard to comprehend when you look at this type of leap in a six month period. So I, we're very much only at the beginning of its, of its potential, of its capabilities on how it's going to be driving an entirely new world that we're gonna be living in um, during these next five to 10 years. Um, some new innovations that ChatGPT have push, pushed out have redefined entire industries. For example, uh, Code Interpreter was a recent um, innovation that ChatGPT rolled out um, only a couple months ago. And the century very much replaces a lot of the everyday work of an analyst, of a data analyst where essentially what you can do is take any CSV file, upload it in the chat GPT, and have it instantly start analy analyzing that data and, and giving you graphs and charts that help you frame what is in that data that can be useful to you. Um, you can have it create uh, useful visualizations based upon a certain uh, view or cut of the data. Things that we never would have imagined possible that we would have had analysts have to do in the past is something that just on some random Tuesday, this company pushed out and literally will have a transformative effect on so many industries, including the industry I'm in, market research, uh, not the least of which financial um, services and healthcare and so many other industries. Many consumers are slow to adapt, but, they're, but they are slowly um, jumping on it. So despite the fact that we've had sort of a meteoric um, adoption of ChatGPT, we are still early days, and especially uh, with companies um, where you can see how many, uh, what percentage of respondents um, have multiple functions using AI. And it's nowhere near where we thought it would be. Now, the problem with doing webinars like this is the data is changing so fast um, with AI that as soon as I put a deck together, it becomes outdated. So um, this data is probably um, needs to be updated as well, because I do see obviously many more um, here in Q4 businesses adopting these AI tools. I mentioned earlier that many of us will start to begin to use AI tools without us even knowing it. Um, this is a perfect example of it. So Microsoft uh, recently announced that they're putting um, an AI powered co-pilot in its office suite of tools. So you're talking about PowerPoint um, and Excel and Word. And over time, what you're going to start to see is you're going to learn how to use these sorts of tools by just using the tools that you already use. So by using PowerPoint, this AI um, copilot uh, co will give you suggestions on how to write a slide or how to formulate a slide or how to uncover a different piece of data you can actually push in. So I think this is going to be more the norm where instead of having consumers have to seek out AI, AI functionality is going to come to them within the tools that they already use. Again, lowering the bar of consumer adoption because you are not asking consumers to change their habits. Let's look at the metaverse, for example. I have no idea how to access the metaverse. Here I am, CEO of a tech company. I don't even know how to join it. I don't know anyone who's ever even been in the metaverse. When you talk about virtual reality and people using these masks, 
That's a perfect example of people having to change their behavior, wearing these big clunky masks to access a new experience. None of that exists with AI. It's just being brought to you um, in your everyday life, in your current work stream, which again, with amongst the landscape of a tool even becoming more powerful, really opens up so much potential. Um, what, how is ChatGPT and these uh, platforms being used? Well, there's really five main places that we're seeing ChatGPT get adopted. Um, idea generation, content creation, uh, research and analysis, coding and development, and and translation. And conversational AI is almost an application of many of those things. Um, but these are ways that companies are instantly started seeing ways to put it to life. So oh, I used to run a, um, for many years, a, an ad agency that I started. And I would tell you that if I was still the CEO of an ad agency today, I would be relooking at my business uh, because so many of the work streams that my former ad agency had to do are being replicated by these AI tools. And while it's not at the exact quality that you might get from a Madison Avenue ad agency, it is getting closer and closer every day, especially when you come to thinking of creative and marketing throughout the lens of impact. Is this working or is it not? I think you know what we saw through the rise of, of the 30 second spot is the ad, ad industry industrial complex was very much predicated on good creative and fancy TV spots, but we got often disconnected from impact. And when you look at AI, there are no award shows, right? There are no people patting themselves on the back. There's just machines that are learning in terms of what works and how to drive impact. And in a world of um, an uncertain economic landscape, I think that many more marketers are gonna be gravitating towards AI because while you may lose some of the human touch, you are going to be solely focused on the business results, which is what every CFO at so many of the companies you work for are thinking about. How can me putting $1 in get me $3 out? If you tell AI to do it, it's going to focus on it. If you tell a human to do it, they're also going to be creating things to make sure that they look good or that they're going to be um, you know, creating something that they're personally interested in. Um, or working on details that don't really matter relative to the results because we're humans, we have emotions, and that's what makes us different than AI. But when it comes to actually being very rigid and ROI driven, again, something that so many of us are being pushed to do, that's something where AI can outpace a human. And it's going to be so interesting to see how it evolves. You know, influencer marketing is obviously huge. And this um, influencer, uh, Lil McQuella, is reportedly making nearly $10 million a year, and it's basically a bot that's an influencer. Um, and this, th this AI driven influencer understands through being data driven exactly what the audience wants and exactly how to keep the audience engaged and essentially creating an influencer that people are following for advice on fashion and beauty and so many topics. And it's not even a person. Now, is this gimmicky? Sure, sure it's gimmicky. Um, but I do believe this, this is sort of an early indicator of some areas that we might be going. Um, one of the most, uh, I think, powerful ways that companies are going to start to soon adopt AI is in the customer experience um, and customer service. Um, I think this is an area where every company can get better at serving a group of constituents. Now, those constituents could be your customers. They also could be your employees. Um, they could be um, people who you're working with and partnering with. Uh, but if you go back to the original framework or model of AI, if it starts with data or information or a neural network, ultimately that information could be anything. And at first, many companies were scared of using this because they thought that their data was going to leak and get out. And over time, that seems to be a problem that's getting solved by a lot of these companies, where essentially you can create a firewalled network of information. So that network of information could be, if you're a consulting firm, every single report that you've ever done, every single proposal, that you've ever delivered to a client. And that essentially feeds a large language model um, or a, a neural network of information that then you could talk to and say, what information have we ever uncovered um, about macaroni and cheese? And any information, any insight, any research that maybe 50,000 people have done at Deloitte or Accenture now becomes instantly available. Um, the same goes to an airline who might've been asked information about very obscure types of um, you know, situations that travelers may uh, have encountered. Well, if it can actually crawl through all the chat information, all the case logs that that airline has ever had, 
Now, all of a sudden, you have an all-knowing customer service rep. Um, so when you think about the applications of something like this, where this bank of knowledge could be created, it just unlocks incredible things. And I'll talk a little bit later about healthcare. But to me, that's an area which is going to have, I think, one of the highest impacts on humanity in terms of how AI is going to be transforming. Now, it's highly, there's a highly complex regulatory framework in the healthcare industry. However, if you think about the core problem that if you come in with a bunch of symptoms and you talk to a doctor, your doctor is limited by his or her worldview of being a doctor, meaning their knowledge of different symptoms, different causes. But if you could talk to a AI doctor that actually had every single healthcare related study, um, every patient record that was anonymized, every single uh, output of every surgery, how you can connect different types of symptoms, different causes, you may not hear those horror stories anymore of doctors misdiagnosing things because it's a lot harder for an AI platform that has the knowledge of every healthcare instance in history, or at least within a particular um, vertical of healthcare to actually deliver for you. And I think that's sort of the promise that you can create where you essentially can create a brain that's much larger um, and has much more data than any human can based upon the context of what they're able to attain um, as a human being. Um, it's obviously freaking out many different categories, many service industries, um, accountants, lawyers, et cetera. Um, they understand how AI can have a big impact on what they're doing based upon the same premise that if a lawyer understood every case in history and everything the Supreme Court ever ruled on, every appeal that ever got upheld, well, the, and then wrote contracts based upon that and gave advice based upon that, they'd probably be a pretty damn good lawyer and probably a lot more inexpensive than traditional lawyers. Now, we're not exactly there yet. This is a lawyer um, now known as a chat GPT lawyer who actually cited the wrong case law because ChatGPT happened to hallucinate and give him the wrong information, which he presented to a judge. And the latest I read is he could get disbarred. So we aren't there yet, right? Just like we aren't there with driverless vehicles. But in the case of both, I don't think you pull them off the road because you look at the promise of this and how it can maybe help our legal system. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity, but we also need to understand that this is very early days uh, with this technology. Uh, one huge application uh, that I'm a big believer in is AI's personal assistant, meaning so I just gave you the, the example of a company banking all of its information to unlock it to its employees or customers. But imagine you as the CEO of you, right, of your own company of yourself, trying to perform the best you can um, financially um, in terms of your own personal health, in terms of the relationships that are near or dear to you. Well, if you could feed in all this information, again, in a way that protects your privacy and data security and have a personal assistant that can tell you how you should be spending your time, it could really unlock a much more productive, much more well-rounded version of you. Meaning it could tell you you haven't called your Aunt Ginny in three months and you should, or it's your best friend's birthday in two weeks. And they've recently been posting about um, the Philadelphia Eagles. So you should send them a Philadelphia Eagles jersey or you know, we noticed through your Wi-Fi connected scale that you put on a couple pounds and maybe um, you should order this tonight or go to this restaurant instead and order this. Um, or you seem to be spending more money on this category. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should be putting your money elsewhere. So all these individual things um, that are driven by data are just great pieces of advice. And if you connect your Apple Watch and your financial um, accounts and your calendar and your email and all these things to this personal assistant, well, then maybe you could have somebody who could really help you be more effective in your life. And I think this type of technology, while it's being definitely um, concocted with various different companies right now, is certainly going to create a massive opportunity for people to actually improve their lives um, and to actually uh, perform in a much better way as, as an individual. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Her uh, with Joaquin Phoenix. This is kind of, and this is ahead of its time. It was probably 10 years ago, but Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with his operating system or his phone, which he interacts with in um, AirPod-like devices. Um, the voice is Scarlett Johansson, which probably didn't um, hurt in terms of him falling in love with the voice of uh, and this technology, but um, it was very much 
this AI technology got to know him better over time. And he felt more and more closely connected to technology. And while I'm not suggesting that we're going to have love interests with AI anytime soon, um, it definitely talks about how it can actually start to unlock human persona and allow you to be a better self as a result. Some companies, including Facebook, are playing around with the notion of bringing characters to life through AI. This company, Character.ai, uh, is well-funded and raised, I think, over $100 million to basically allow you to talk to Albert Einstein or Mark Zuckerberg or Gandhi, right, or, and these different people. And based upon the information that they've written and who they are, will answer in a certain way. Um, and I think you're going to start to see more and more of this. In fact, um, Facebook, Meta, Meta, Facebook's parent company, recently announced that influencers are going to be able to create their own version of this to basically be able to scale themselves. So this is definitely another trend uh, that you should expect to see come to bear um, in the months and quarters ahead. Uh, so a lot of the examples we've talked about in this presentation so far are about outputting text. But one of the big innovations that we're going to see in the year ahead is not outputting text, um, but outputting actual uh, multimedia. So imagery, videos, all sorts of things based upon uh, your input. Uh, this is an example of Dolly 2, which is part of um, ChatGPT. And basically it's about outputting images versus outputting text. And if you prompt it in, I wanna see a raccoon playing tennis at Wimbledon in the 1990s, this is what you would see. Now, is this a silly example? Sure, but if you think about how much time people spend creating artwork, uh, creating type of creative assets, uh, it's getting closer and closer. I actually read this morning that Google is slowly integrating technology where instead of you having to search for a, a type of photo, which you would copy and put into a presentation, you could ask just Google to generate that photo. So instead of you looking for something, it's actually creating what you're looking for. Um, and that's a whole different form of search and a whole different way that we're gonna be interacting with our technologies because instead of us researching, we're commissioning. Um, and so many incredible tools have come out, whether it's on-demand product video ads for e-commerce or a platform called Synthesia, which allows you to actually write a full script for a tutorial video, pick an avatar, pick their accent or language, um, and hit generate, and then in 15 minutes, you actually have a training video that's made by somebody where you don't have to hire the person, you don't have to set the sound and lighting and production. And for many companies that are, are focused on training employees or training customers, as this technology gets better, because admittedly it still has some, some room to, to run, um, I think it's gonna be incredibly impactful in terms of how companies communicate uh, with their constituents. Um, and now we're getting into not just text to image, but text to videos. Platforms like Runway allow you to type out a scene. And these platforms actually um, generate videos based upon your vision of what it can be. So you could have a man running through a forest with purple unicorns and a green sky um, holding a hot dog, and you will get that. Um, and you will get it instantly. And, um, you know, is this the future of movie production? It remains to be seen, but again, we are so early on and the, the capabilities here are really endless and, and really fascinating. Um, we've recently seen through the writer strike that happened that there's a lot of concern in Hollywood about AI. Uh, many writers are concerned that they're going to be on the outside looking in as more shows and, and, and producers use this type of technology um, to better uh, the content they're pushing out and also make it much more efficient. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the show Black Mirror, but there's actually an episode of Black Mirror with Selma Hayek where Selma Hayek's name and likeness and her face and her body are put into a show and she's acting a role that she didn't agree to act. And it was a pretty off-putting role where now she, you know, then, then in the show, she kind of got, um, had a lot of backlash from society. Uh, but is this going to be art imitating life down the line? And a lot of actors now are worried about protecting their name and likeness and have it not putting it to AI. And obviously where this gets scariest is in the world that we're in right now, um, in this macro um, environment where there's so much geopolitical unrest, we are entering an election year and you're already starting to see on social platforms, people's names and likenesses getting hijacked um, for nefarious purposes, having people say things that they didn't really say. Um, and these sorts of things can spark um, civil unrest, they can spark political unrest, um, and it's really scary to think about um, in terms of 
did they really say that? Did this really happen? Um, we already entered this world in 2020, but now with this technology, this is where it gets real, right? Now, one saving grace, ironically, as I talked on the onset about crypto and blockchain technology, well, actually, this is where those two worlds could actually meet, where the reality is that blockchain is a public ledger where actually you can authenticate if things, if people own something or not. Well, you can also authenticate if people said something or not. And I believe there's going to be a slew of new technologies based upon blockchain that do a good job of validating if this photo or if this video is real. So expect to see a lot more in that area moving forward. Um, talking about, you know, having people say and do things that they didn't, uh, you may have seen that, um, you know, the huge pop stars, hip hop stars, Drake and The Weeknd had an AI hit that they, that were produced with their voices that they never produced. And this was a very popular song that consumers love using these people's voices that they had no part of and wanted no part of and wanted down right away because they're artists and they want their artists to be uniquely part of what they're doing. But I think you're going to start to see more and more of this. You're going to start to see AI music artists, AI visual artists that are going to start to create incredible works. Now, some people can say that's not art, but we've seen the impact of Photoshop and the impact of NFT based art and all these things impact where many consumers don't really care. I mean, I remember when these animated movies were first started coming out and people were saying, no one's going to go to see a Pixar movie. There's no real actors in that. Well, guess what? They do. That, th that company did pretty well. I remember when electronic dance music came out and people said, no one's going to come to see a DJ hitting buttons. There's no instruments. They're not a real artist. But if you go to the electronic uh, uh, dance carnival in Las Vegas every year, you'll see that there's half a million people show up to watch DJs do just that. So the technology is there. The consumer habits are there. And I think this is only going to continue to exacerbate uh, moving forward. Some other areas that to think about that, that AI is certainly going to be changing is the world of education. Um, many students are using AI to, um, let's just say, cut some corners um, on their term papers and, and things that they have to hand in. Um, there are some teachers that are just trying to remove it completely. I think it's a terrible idea because the reality is those same students are going to be entering the workforce and interviewing with people like me who are trying to constantly think about how to put AI in their product roadmap. And if those students were removed from the ability from using this platform, they're going to be disadvantaged in the workforce, which is exactly the opposite of what a lot of these education institutions are trying to impart in students, especially, especially higher ed, the amount of debt they take on, they're going to pay those loans back. You pay the loans back by getting jobs and you get jobs by understanding how technologies like this work, right? So I think it's, it's incumbent upon professors to integrate this into their curriculum, but how to do it in a way that doesn't take learning out of the equation and doing out of the equation is definitely a fine line and something that I think it's going to be a while before the, the proper best practices are instituted in this regard. Um, I talked earlier about, you know, the impact on medical and, and I was really pleased that Google's testing um, its medical AI chatbot at the Mayo Clinic. I think this is going to be just a massive because we talk about, yeah, it can, it can now put videos and this and that, but if it saves lives, you know, then it really starts to, I think, bring out the AI optimists and, and the people who believe that AI is good for society because there's plenty of people that are proclaiming the opposite. And this is great to see. And I'm going to be really curious to see in the next year, again, within a very highly regulated environment, which is the healthcare world, um, how quickly this gets adopted. So um, you're seeing a lot with the financial services sector, with people like Gary Gensler wanting to keep finance safe. Uh, for humans, many um, investors have started to toy around with AI-driven financial advisors, which, um, you know, on the surface seems like it makes a lot of sense because financial investing is completely data-driven. And in fact, the worst investors are the ones who get emotional, who get fearful when, when a stock drops and sells it, and it gets over-optimistic and buys a stock when it's at its high, when the reality is you want to, you know, buy low and sell high. Um, so I can see a world where the wealth management, financial services space is largely AI driven, but obviously that comes with its amount of risks. And it's something that both consumers and the industry are going to have to kind of um, juggle. But at the same time, you know, here's an AI powered stock portfolio that beat the S&P 500. So the technology again, isn't far away. Um, 
I, you know, I'm not here talking about the metaverse, which is going to be this crazy thing in 10 years from now. I'm talking about things that people are using and companies are building now and things are in, applica in application form um, as of today. So the fear is real. The fear is everywhere. Um, you know, there are a lot of pessimists out there that are saying um, AI outweighs the risk. The reality is, though, it doesn't matter because it's not, we're not going backwards. This technology is not going away. It's not going to be regulated. It actually can't be regulated because these large language models that crawl data, some of them can actually fit on a thumb drive. Um, and if one country bans it, there's going to be another country that's just going to push it. So I don't think that this is going to be regulated. I don't think it can be regulated. I think it's going to be up to the free markets uh, to regulate. And the good thing is whenever we talk about AI, um, you know, for these terrible purposes, well, AI can also be used to thwart the bad guys as well. Right. So the power of AI will be on both sides, which is kind of a leveling effect that I don't really um, hear a lot. And obviously the benefits of it is AI could possibly help with inflation. It could make companies more impactful, you know, ultimately as a society, especially in America, you know, there's a real productivity problem. Um, when we are compared against other developed nations where um, people work longer hours, they take less vacations, and overall their societies are more productive. The entitlements of those consumers um, aren't as high, and the culture and society of America has led our country to have its highest debt as a percentage of GDP ever. We have a country that's largely in debt based upon um, us being less productive, right? And ultimately, how do you reverse that? Well, in the past, technology has shown to reverse it. Um, many people focus on its potential to eliminate jobs, but the reality is new jobs can be created in a society that's more productive. And I think AI's ability to make our, our country more productive and our world more productive and curb the current inflation problem um, is a real thing. Um, and obviously that's gonna have to be uh, juggled with the concerns that are real of large companies. Uh, you probably saw this story that came out this past spring where Samsung employees leaked confidential product information to chat GPT. Um, and then uh, the companies basically banned it. They left it a ban. They rebanned it. They're, you know, uh, rightfully concerned. But again, I think some of these technologies are going to be implemented very quickly where people feel safe. There was also a time where when consumers were first buying things online, there was just so much fraud and credit card numbers were getting stolen and, and platforms are getting hacked. And sure, that happens now, but the financial industry covers you if, if your credit card gets stolen and people steal from you. And the, there's SSO and, tech and encryption technology that allows you to feel more secure when you're buying things. And as society and as, as industries adopt it, e-commerce became commonplace and concerns like this became less prevalent. I think the same is going to happen uh, with AI. Um, many... Uh, people who create intellectual property are concerned. We talked about writers in Hollywood, well, it's also authors as well, about how their content is being used in a way that doesn't compensate them to feed these models. So if ChatGPT is crawling through people's books and their, their intellectual property, and then people are, se are selling services based upon that, where the people who actually are originating the content aren't compensated, well, that could be an issue. And we saw the same thing happen with Napster when it first came out in the music space and YouTube, which almost got sued to oblivion before Google uh, bailed it out. Um, the benefit is, so I wrote a book 10 years ago called Youth Nation. And I've been approached uh, by a publisher to write the second version. And I actually went in ChatGPT and asked if it, if it knew my first book. It did. And I asked it if, it if I were to write version two of this 10 years later, what would the 10 chapters be? And it listed out 10 pretty damn good chapters. And I actually started to ask it to write the first chapter for me. And while then it started to lose me in terms of really conveying my voice, it did this all in a 10 minute span. Um, so the benefit of that is it make, it make people a lot more productive. The downside is somebody else could be writing version two of my original book at using my original works and I'm not getting compensated for it, right? So it's two sides of, uh, of the coin and uh, we're gonna have to obviously do a good job on an industry specific basis working through some of these issues and there will be no shortage of lawsuits when it comes to ip um, and protection uh, as well so one of the biggest questions i get all the time is is are we going to be working for robots is ai going to take my job um my response to that is if i were giving uh and this is how i give my kids advice but i get asked often what advice should i give my kids 
It's like, I'll give this presentation on stage. People will wait in line. They'll talk to me afterwards and they'll say, I'm super scared. What, what job is my kid going to have? What do I tell them? And I always tell them the same thing that you should tell your kid to go very deep into an art or very deep into a science. If you go deep into an art, you're using your intellectual ability, your emotional ability, your creativity to build things that machines still can't, right? You're connecting with people on an emotional level. You're leveraging empathy to actually be in the world of art or go deep into a science, learn how to build, learn how to operate the machinery and the technology that we're talking about today. Those are the two paths. And I think the path that won't exist anymore is master of all trades, jack of none, right? Um, because I think if you're in a job where you're pushing papers along or you're a middle management, um, ultimately, if you're not a creator or you're somebody who is managing the technology, the, the technology itself will disintermediate you and, and will remove those jobs. And I think that's ultimately the world and the bifurcation of opportunity that's being created through AI. So AI is going to take people's jobs. We saw IBM announce in May that it plans to replace nearly 8,000 jobs with AI, but there are going to be new jobs created in those two areas. And that's where I would really focus uh, for sure. So um, I'm skipping around here because I want to make sure we have time for questions. But, you know, I, I think to wrap before we dive into some questions, this all seems like a lot. And we all, I could see some of the titles of the people who are on this um, webinar, they all have different jobs and responsibilities. And you're not going to be able to transform your company all at once. The way that we've been really trying to drive transformation of our organization as a software company in this world of AI is really in three different steps. The first and foremost is in cultural adoption, getting your employees, getting your customers to understand these technologies and tools so they believe in it. That, and they feel empowered by it versus feeling, feeling fearful of it. The second is positioning. How does your company present itself to the marketplace based upon this cultural adoption? And then lastly, over time, and for some companies it'll be now and some companies will be three years from now, how do you integrate it into your product offering? How do you integrate it into your consumer experience the way that consumers touch your product? That's ultimately the path that companies can transform and Digital was the same thing. Mobile was the same thing. And as I spoke at the onset, I think this is going to be even a more powerful application um, that, than those technologies. Um, as, a, as a nice little side gift for some of you guys who joined today, um, we are giving you guys a free um, 50 plus top AI tools you can download if you go to this URL here, um, engage.susie.com slash AI keynote. So feel free to, to check that out as well. And I'm going to see if we have some time for questions. So I really appreciate um, everyone joining today. Um, will the presentation be made available? Yes, uh, we will definitely make the presentation available. Um, a question I got is, if I don't know anything about AI, where do I start? How do I start to actually leverage these tools um, in my life? And the best thing I can say to you is pick a task, um, any task that you're maybe struggling with and log in and ask it to help you solve a task. For example, this past summer, my wife was having 18 people over for a barbecue over Labor Day. Um, there were like five kids, 13 adults, and um, some had different allergies. And it was pretty overwhelming to figure out what should I make for everybody? What, what ingredients should I have? And she basically just asked ChatGPT and basically said, I have 18 people coming over, 13 are adults. Here are their allergies, here are themes. And it spit out a shopping list. It spit out ingredients, it spit out what to make. And it was a great night, right? And that was something that would have been very stressful in the past. And now it's something that became alleviated by this tool and saved a lot of time and um, actually allowed us to focus more on our guests than, than figuring all that stuff out, right? And I think that's a great analogy for how you can look at using these tools is what are some of the tasks that on an everyday basis, personally, um, or at work that you struggle with? What are some of those blocks that you have? And then just go try to input. If you don't know how to actually use it or access the tool, I would actually just watch a YouTube video on how to use Google Bard or how to use ChatGPT and just watch a one-on-one -on -one tutorial because it really is that simple. And it's not a leap to think that people um, will instantly understand how to use it. So I think understanding that it, it is really the first step. Um, another question I often get is, 
How do I, um, you know, get my organization on board? How do I get my com my company to believe if I want to be that change agent for AI at my company? What do I do? And ultimately, it's you having hands on keyboard, you trying out some of the tools that we spoke about today, or some of the tools in this fifty plus list that, as you can see in the chat, we're going to allow you to download. Um, that will allow you to become an expert in your own right. And you don't need to be a whiz coder to understand how to use these tools. But if you understand how to use four or five of them and you start showing people, you could be seen as a thought leader. If you start to post on LinkedIn about how you're using these things, even in the simplest of ways, like creating an ingredient list, all of a sudden you can start to be a catalyst for, for a drive of change um, in culture at your organization. And that will make waves, not only with your organization, but also with you, your career. There is not one industry right now that isn't, uh, doesn't have CEOs staying up all night thinking about AI and actually how it's going to impact or disrupt their jobs and their business and their customers. And it's really incumbent on all of us to service our employers or our customers to come up with solutions. And again, you don't need to have new skills necessarily to do it. You just have to be willing to try. And so many people have blocks here that are preventing them from doing it. And it's going to be at their own detriment, um, I believe, in their career moving forward. Because while AI might not replace your job, somebody who understands AI will. And that's a, that's a phrase I, I hear often, and I, I couldn't agree with that more. So I think that's ultimately the biggest opportunity. So um, I'm going to wrap here. I really just want to thank all of you for joining. Um, we will share the presentation with all attendees. And um, if we at Suzy can help you understand AI, whether it's within your industry or how it relates to research and understanding consumers, uh, we're always here to help. So on behalf of the Suzy team, I want to thank you for joining our latest episode of Speed of Culture. Until the next time, we'll see you soon, everyone. Take care.